Fail safe. I fly Immersion RC Ghost. I fly Express LRS. I fly Crossfire. I fly those protocols because I don't ever want to have to think about fail safe ever again. And today I did fail safe. And that means I'm making a video about how to troubleshoot when your receiver is fail safing. I'm Joshua Bardwell, and you're going to learn something today. Do you know what a failsafe is? I'm pretty sure you said yes to that. But I spend a lot of time answering people's questions, and I've found that a lot of people don't really know all of the things that can cause a failsafe. So we're going to start this video by defining a failsafe and talking about each of the steps that can fail to cause a failsafe. Because troubleshooting a failsafe is just going through those steps and figuring out which one is broken. And a failsafe means that the link between your controller and your flight controller is broken in some way, and then your quadcopter falls out of the air. So most people, when they think about a failsafe, they think about the classic situation where you flew too far away, you didn't have enough range. Now, on modern protocols like Ghost, Crossfire, and Express LRS, even Tracer, the, the range is usually pretty extreme and you have to try pretty hard to actually fail safe it. That's one of the reasons you use those protocols. But on older protocols like FreeSky Spectrum and FlySky receivers, the, you know, it wasn't too hard to fail safe them. You'd go behind a building, you'd go, you'd go too far away, boom, you fail safe, quad falls out of the air. The other things that can cause a fail safe are anything that could be interrupting that link, which basically um, amounts to the wiring. So we could have a bad, bad signal wire, bad power wire, even a bad ground wire, and we could have damaged hardware. The receiver is more likely to be damaged than the module because the module is safe and sound in your hands and the receiver is out there in the world getting bashed to crap. Now, if you are smart, you will have RSSI and LQ set up in your goggle. And these are the two major metrics that you're going to lose, use to tell if you are at risk of fail safing due to excess range. And of those two, LQ is the one that you really want to be paying attention to. So LQ is stands for link quality, and it basically refers to what percent of the data packets between the controller and the flight controller are getting through. At 100% LQ, all your data gets through and everything is wonderful. At 70% LQ, 70% 70 of your packets are getting through and you could probably still keep flying, but it's not the best situation. Uh, and as the LQ goes down, eventually you reach a point where the link is essentially dead and you fail safe. So then what about RSSI? RSSI is the signal strength. It is the sort of raw loudness of the signal that is being received. And it's actually not how I think you should uh, test whether your link is at risk of fail saving. Because think about a situation where uh, we're sitting in a quiet room and I'm just like screaming in your ear. Well, I have a lot of RSSI, a lot of signal strength. Uh, now think about the same situation where we're at a, like a loud rock concert and I'm screaming in your ear and you can barely hear me because just the music is that loud. In both cases, I'm putting out a lot of energy. I'm putting out a lot of RSSI, but in one case, there is a lot of competing noise, which is drowning me out. So RSSI alone cannot tell you whether your link's about to fail safe because we don't, you don't know the, the ambient noise and there's always ambient RF noise all around the environment. You don't know what the noise level is. Since you don't know the noise level, you can't know the, the signal to noise ratio, which is what you would need to know to tell if you were about to fail safe. So if you're curious whether you're at risk of fail safing because your link is because you're flying too far away or you're flying behind an obstacle, look at LQ. And if LQ is less than 100%, maybe 90, 95%, then you should at least think about what you're doing because that's, that starts to be pretty unusual because these protocols are so freaking good. That they, okay. So what is RSSI good for then? Well, that brings us to today's video. Take a look at the RSSI here. Uh, on the table, right close together like this, the RSSI should be extremely high. Um, one of the confusing things about RSSI is that it's measured in a unit called DBM, decibel milliwatts, and DBMs start at zero and go down, okay? 
So the DBM that we're seeing here is about negative 18, negative 20. And that's actually really, really good. Like that's like we're practically touching. And then uh, uh, the actual lower bound for what might be like a low RSSI, well, it depends on various conditions, but an RSSI around, of around negative 90 to negative 115 dBm would be where many typical like Ghost, Express, LS, Tracer, and Crossfire would fail safe, okay? Um, so a, this is like extremely good RSSI. But watch what happens if I move this quadcopter just a little bit further away. Do you see that it's occasionally dipping down into the negative 70s and negative 80s? It's happening really quickly. So it's, I wouldn't blame you if you found it a little hard to see. That's really, un, that just should never be happening it, this close. That's way, way off. So the way that we can use RSSI is that like under controlled conditions, like just a few feet apart here on the bench, if we see an RSSI that is lower than we would expect, that could indicate a hardware problem like a messed up antenna or a damaged receiver or something like that. Um, and if you're not sure what like a, a normal value of RSSI would be, pull out your quadcopter, pull out your, your your radio, pull out your module and put them, you know, like one meter apart. Okay, three feet for you Americans. I'm so European now. Put them like a, a one meter apart. You got to make sure the orientation of the antennas is consistent between your tests because changing the antenna orientation will definitely affect the results. So you're going to put them exactly the same orientation, exactly the same distance, and then just look. Look at the RSSI and then pull out another quad and just get a baseline for what number you're used to seeing. And then in a situation like this where you have a random fail safe, you look at the RSSI and go, oh, there's something right here. Now, if I had looked at that number and I had seen a consistently high RSSI, negative 20, right, something like that, I would still have to figure out why the failsafe happened, because, but I would be reasonably confident that it wasn't bad hardware. It's not, I mean, nothing's 100%, but uh, in this case, I feel reasonably confident that I do have bad hardware. So how am I going to proceed? I'm going to grab another quad with Ghost in it, and I'm going to do the old process of elimination. Um, we can see this number is hovering in the 20s, maybe 30s, sometimes a little bit down to the 40s as I move it around, but in general, it is not dipping into the 80s and the 90s like we saw with the other receiver. So that is indicating to us that this receiver, Telemetry not this lost. receiver, that that receiver has a problem, or maybe the antenna has a problem. But that helps us believe that our module is fine, because if the module is messed up, we would see the problem across multiple quads. Now, the most obvious thing that could cause low, low signal strength would be the antenna being damaged. And I don't see any fraying in the wire, nor do I see any damage here. Now, it's quite common to get a little bit of like prop damage here at the ends of the antenna, and that does have a small effect on the RSSI, but it wouldn't cause these wild swings like we're seeing. Um, nevertheless, this antenna is practically completely intact. Um, I wonder if I just unplug and replug the UFL connector, what will happen? Maybe even a little worse. It's definitely solidly hitting the 80s. 100. When I put my hand over it, it went all the way down to, oh, wow. When I put my hand over it, it's just sitting solidly at negative 80 to negative 90. That's just no good. Um, I feel like we probably have a damaged receiver here. Uh, just in the interest of science, I am going to replace the antenna. But these, these, I just don't see any damage to the antenna, so I don't think that's it. Now, at this point, you may be wondering why I am not investigating the flight controller. And I'm also not investigating the wiring between the flight controller and the receiver. And the reason for that is that the RSSI, the signal strength, is 100% a, a, a part of the wireless radio interface between this antenna and this antenna, okay? Nothing about the flight controller can change the RSSI that's measured by the receiver. So the fact that low RSSI is a symptom completely rules out anything to do with the flight controller. It's not the issue. We're going to replace the receiver. That's what we got to do. Okay, moment of truth.
RSSI is normal as expected. It was a bad receiver. And that's often what it is. So let's sum up the troubleshooting process. The first question you want to ask when you're troubleshooting uh, fail safes is, is it always the same quad that's having the problem or are there multiple quads that are having the problem? If there are multiple quads having the problem, that points to your radio as the, as the common link. If it's only one quad that's having the problem, it points to the receiver or the antenna most likely on that quad. Next, you want to look at your RSSI. If your RSSI is strong and consistent, then probably your antenna is fine and maybe your receiver is fine. It t tends to indicate that the, the hardware is okay. If RSSI is high and you're still having fail-safes, it could point to a problem with the wiring, such as you have a bad power, you know, your 5-volt wire or your signal wire is damaged, or it could point to interference. That's the other thing. If you only fail-safe in certain locations but not other locations, then it could be local interference uh, in the area. There's not a lot you can do about that except increase your transmit power maybe, but probably you're just going to fly in a different location. Uh, that's going to do it. i got to put this quadcopter back together because I'm using this for my, see this KISS Ultra flight controller? Yeah. I am going to be putting a FETTEC G4 and a Betaflight 4.3 flight controller in this exact same quad, and I'm testing them to see how they fly. Get rid of that receiver. Uh, so i got to get this thing back, put back together to get back to work on that, but that's going to do it for this video. I'm so glad you came, and I hope it was helpful to uh, to you if you're troubleshooting this problem. If you value this kind of content, can I remind you that I have a Patreon page. Patreon is a website where you can subscribe to me for as little as $2 a month or more if you feel like I've earned it. The amount that you contribute is totally up to you. It's just a little monthly payment that I can count on. It helps me, uh, you know, YouTube can be very fickle. Uh, but the Patreon means that every month I feel confident that I'm going to get a certain amount from the people who support what I do. And if today's the day where you feel like doing that, then thank you. And if today's not the day, if you don't feel like I've earned it yet, that's fine too. I give away all my content for free. I help everybody. Everyone is welcome to email me or message me on Facebook. Those are the main ways to get a hold of me. I always take care of my patrons first, but I, I zero my inbox. Uh mostly every day, maybe more than once a day. And uh, hopefully, if today's not the day, uh, then someday it will be. Uh, there's a link in the video description if that day is the day for you, patreon.com. And uh, that's going to do it for this video. Happy flying. What are you doing in here? The least you could do is subscribe or join my Patreon or like, just, here's another video I picked out for you. Jeez.